We are going live. It is live, our Indigenous Peoples Week Hangout for August 5th, 2014. This is day number two, and we have uh, one of the largest conglomeration of participants in the Google Hat I've had the honor of moderating. We'll see how well that goes. Uh, six gentlemen and uh, three virtual Sonyas. So welcome, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to just ask you a question before you introduce yourselves and uh, we'll just make it very quick but are you satisfied with the level of media coverage we have for indigenous tourism Ethan you start sorry I had muted my microphone I didn't realize you were gonna throw me to the lions first <clears throat> Um, am I am I satisfied with media coverage of indigenous tourism? The the, the real quick answer is no, not not at all. Okay, um, great. Uh, great. Ron, yes, uh, no. <laughs> Mike, Mike, are you there? No, Abishak, are you there? Yes, uh, I and uh, it's no. Carlos, uh, well, I'm not. I'm not convinced about the enough media for the like indigenous peoples. I don't think. I don't think it's enough. But I think there's a lack of education as well. Okay, for those we'll, come people back, we'll come back. We'll come back, Mike. No, I agree. Okay, now listen, I'm going to let you folks introduce yourself, uh, and my apologies for going all ESP and shouting on you. Uh, but I think we we have to acknowledge the fact that we're, for the most part, we're fairly dissatisfied with how things are covered. So I'm going to go back to you and in the order we we did before, and and flesh it out a little bit. Where are we? And where do you, where should we be going? And please introduce yourselves. Go back to Ethan. Uh, my name is Ethan Gilber. I wear a lot of hats. Uh, for the purposes of this hangout, I am. Uh, one of the co-founders of Outbounding, a uh, community-powered platform curating travel content excellence, uh, looking for great content, ethical content, responsible content, meaningful content, and sharing it with as large and wide an audience as possible. Um, in my other guises, I have a, a strong and long-lasting focus on responsible and sustainable travel and tourism. Uh, how uh, travelers can be more mindful, conscious of the of, of the of the impact they make on the world and how they can actually make it more positive, um, the actions they take, the cultures that they that they that they visit, the the money that they spend, the nature that they appreciate, um, the um, with specific regard to indigenous tourism. Although I don't have any particular specialization in the area, I have on numerous occasions fielded and edited and in some cases written articles about uh, about indigenous tourism or focusing on indigenous tourism and to the degree that I can in the content that I write and that I edit I'm always trying to get a level deeper than most of the content that I read goes uh, that is a rather sweeping generalization about how media coverage of indigenous tourism can be a bit pandering um, and by pandering I mean um, Superficial playing on stereotypes, uh, not necessarily, uh, not necessarily giving uh, due reverence to the cultures that they're talking about, and the careful decisions that have been made in most cases by indigenous <laughs> communities about how to represent their interests and and open them up to a more broad uh, a broader public. Um, but but it is a very very complex issue and and the decisions that people make are informed by a lot of things I just think that we can all as an industry uh, be a bit more go 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 deeper so there's a lot more context than than is often revealed and I think it's time for us to actually push to reveal that context thank you very much uh, Greg I'm gonna pass the baton over to yourself uh, <clears throat> my name is Greg Hubbs. I'm uh, the editor-in-chief of Transitions Abroad. Um, Ron's been a uh, contributor, contributor to Transitions going back, I don't know how many years you worked with my father, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, my father, at, in, in conjunction with Ron and, and uh, some other uh, contributors, 
have long been interested in responsible travel and indigenous uh, tur tourism. So I, I've heard, it's nice to hear uh, uh, so many people so concerned about the same issues that he, he voiced to me. And I see going back in the issues he published in the magazine 20 years ago. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I do see a lot of preaching to the choir. There's a small group of people who are speaking to each other whereas the, um, the uh, commercial or more mainstream press uh, takes very little interest in uh, indigenous tourism um, in general. Um, uh, so uh, my concern is uh, somehow lifting the uh, profile such that it is not a conversation amongst a few people, but amongst a broader public. Uh, so uh, that's why uh, in our editorial we try to do an admixture of content uh, uh, with the implicit notions of responsible travel and not always explicit uh, to, get to, to gain a larger audience. So uh, uh, basically Ethan said everything I, I would have to say about the specifics and you're, he's more in the field as you are. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let's switch it, go back to Carlos. Yes. Can you introduce yourself and uh, talk a little bit how you view indigenous tourism and uh, media coverage? Okay, Carlos is having some technical problems. Abhishek? Yeah, um, can you hear me? Is it all right? Yeah, uh, hi, my, yes. name's, uh, my name's Abhishek uh, Behel and I uh, run wildnavigator.com uh, which is a travel uh, operations based in Edinburgh uh, in Scotland. Uh, we basically, I started uh, at the World uh, Wildlife Day on the 3rd of this year, uh, 3rd of March basically, when we did the chat with Ron and uh, the first chat of the Wildlife uh, Tourism Day. Uh, my main focus for uh, the travel company itself is uh, looking at uh, inspiring journeys in responsible tourism. So we basically look at wilderness uh, tourism as that's the forte basically looking into um, certain uh, apex species. Like, you know, we're looking at uh, birding, we're looking at bird watching um, and aspects of uh, looking into indigenous uh, tourism as well, which uh, I haven't gone into it uh, widely because I don't want to. Uh, I think it's important that um, um, impacts have to be analyzed before uh, we get our steps into all this. Uh, and, and that's the reason why I'm into this chat to hear more about how we can take it, I, how, how I can take it forward, basically. Very good, and thank you for your participation. Uh, Mike, can, can we hear from you? Yeah. Yes. As I say, please yeah. introduce yourself and give us your thoughts on this matter. Okay. Yeah. No. I was just un unmuting myself. I'm Mike Robbins. I'm uh, in Canada, in Toronto. I'm a uh, tourism consultant, and I've been uh, engaged in a lot of um, work with Indigenous peoples in Canada and 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 elsewhere. I lived in and worked in New Zealand for a number of years back in the late '80s, and had the opportunity to work with Maori clients. Um, it's a particular passion of mine. It's not the exclusive uh, area that I that I work in as a tourism consultant, but it is uh, of significant interest to the extent that about nine years ago I set up a uh, a philanthropic fund with my own funds to, uh, um, and it's th that fund is held through a public foundation, an entity called Tides Canada, and and uh, and each year I make donations to support Aboriginal cultural and ecotourism initiatives of one sort or another in Canada here. So I've been involved in some pretty interesting uh, uh, initiatives through the phil philanthropic side and, and professionally as a tourism consultant. And I guess most recently uh, I've just finished working for five years up in a a remote Inuit community in Nunavut up in the Arctic helping them develop a community-based tourism program and they were selected this year as the winner of the community award 
under the uh, Tourism for Tomorrow Awards run by the World Travel and Tourism Council. So, um, and in answer to your question, I mean, my perspective is that there are a lot of good successes out there with Indigenous tourism and there is not enough exposure and celebration of those and sharing of those successes and uh, there is a real urgent need to uh, to help remote Indigenous communities in Canada and elsewhere um, and empower them through tourism because it's one of the few economic development opportunities that a lot of these communities have aside from uh, mining and and uh, and and certain other extractive industries so that's my Mike I, I, just a quick question have our paths cross your name is so familiar yeah I think we met in at a, a ties conference or somewhere along the way we met briefly at one <laughs> well good point. to see you again oh. Uh, great to see you again. Hey, Nicholas, let's pass it over to you. Can you introduce yourself and tell us where were you where you think we're going with media coverage and indigenous indigenous tourism? Sure. Um, also, too, I wish I had one of those lovely logos. For some reason, I can't figure it out. But uh, my name is Nick Stanziano. I'm with SA Expeditions. Um, we're a, a sm small outfit that uh, shares our time between South America and North America, uh, but particularly. Uh, I've been spending most of the last decade uh, in Peru. Um, our company does, we work with, with tourism throughout Peru, but also South America, but we're, we're very active in Peru. And, um, and uh, we, you know, just to kind of give a higher level sense of how at least we envision indigenous tourism or it, it's much more than I think a destination in Peru. It's a very, um, there's, there's a lot of indigenous levels of indigenous still in the country from indigenous who have, be, have grew up in, indigenous, in, in an indigenous lifestyle and now live a modern lifestyle. Um, there's many people who still live, speak indigenous languages in the millions in the Andes of Peru and the Amazon. So when, when we look at indigenous from a perspective of SA Expeditions, it's very holistic. It's um, one, and we'll maybe have a chance to discuss some of our projects in the Chaka Chaka Valley, um, but we also work with a lot of people from drivers to guides to even people in our offices who have grew up in an indigenous lifestyle and are in a process of a transformation or evolution um, into a more modern lifestyle. And so we, we look at... A, we try to look at it a bit holistically, and we think it's 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 a much larger than a than a remote village. But obviously, from a from a perspective of tourism, and uh, bringing folks from across oceans to to uh, experience indigenous lifestyles and kind of create awareness, um, we're we're also very active, and and we believe in the in the promotion of that um, because as I think. Uh, Mr. Robbins mentioned a lot of these communities, the only sort of responsible, positive economic development that a lot of these places can have is, is tourism. So we feel, we feel strongly that it's a positive force um, in, in some to many, many indigenous communities. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and can you tell us uh, where are you originally from? Uh, so I grew, up, I grew up in the mountains of Northern California in the Sierra Nevadas. So... I, uh, about a decade ago, I found myself in uh, the Andes, really just as a young guy exploring. Um, having grown up in the Sierra Nevadas, I wanted to, I wanted to explore the Andes. And, and having read about ancient cultures in, in books that were long gone in the Sierra Nevadas of California, the Andes were always um, very uh, attractive in that sense because it, it's really like trying, time traveling in certain senses, at least from an indigenous perspective. Uh, well, very good to hear from you. Uh, and... Uh, by the way, just a technical note for, for yourself and for Carlos, if you want, you can add that nice little lower third banner. It's, uh, by, it's activated by uh, loading the widget. You have to hover your mouse on the left side of the screen, and you have to open up uh, what's called the toolbox, the Hangout toolbox. And that first icon gets you to the lower third. So we'd love to hear from you. Carlos! We can't, see your, we, we can't see your name either, but we can see you. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm Carlos uh, Hernandez Topete. I am from Oaxaca, Mexico. I had a chance to meet Ron in, um, in 2007 
when I came back to Oaxaca, um, uh, my family business is a language school, but I also founded Fundación Envía, which is a, a micro tourism microfinance organization that run tours to fund um, micro loans for communities around Oaxaca. Many of most of our participants are indigenous people, but many of them are, well, are not strictly indigenous, but they live in indigenous communities. And um, about the hangout, uh, we are, um, well, I agree that there is not enough uh, coverage for uh, about indigenous peoples on the media or on the internet. Okay, beautiful. Um, let me remind everyone who's watching at home, we do have a, a what's called a Q&A app. You're able to ask some questions and I'd like to select, uh, I'd like to select one right now to throw to the crowd for, for comments. And uh, that's from, uh, let's select the one from Sonia, uh, who writes, a photographer friend of mine uh, told me that the Himba people in Namibia were state, uh, a photographer friend of mine told me that the Himba people in Namibia were staged. It made him feel very uncomfortable. Do you think this type of posing for tourists is in fact beneficial to the people or does it impact their dignity? Anyone want to take that one on? Uh, I, I'll I, jump. I, Go ahead. I, I just I would like to get back to the point of, of economic development. I think is a is a really critical um, piece in in the equation. Um, we I know in Peru and, and parts of the jungle we some some programs and experiences borderline on um, being staged to being authentic. And uh, I know in one of our our current projects, which we've just just gotten going, as I mentioned, the Chaka Chaka Valley. One of the one of the key challenges is we want to create capacity building in in the community, and we want to create capacity building in helping them understand what an outsider is interested in and what are true authentic ways that they can share with the outsider. Um, but inevitably, uh, shouldn't say inevitably, but at least a challenge is is that. With with increased passengers and assuming that goal of creating you know responsible economic development, you're always border you're always balancing the fact of, of how do you keep it authentic and how do you keep it authentic long term. Um, it's it's I don't quite have an answer. Uh, I could I I do know some of the ideas that we've been floating around is is the amount of people and the group size that you bring to a particular community trying to quantify what is um, sustainable economic resources needed in in the community to do particular things um, and using that as a benchmark to understand um, the, the quantity the style and and the form in which you bring people and ideally you're you're not you're not bringing you're bringing only enough people where it's it's sustainable and, and healthy for the community, and you haven't gone overboard and 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 flushed either the, the travel operator's pockets or the community with money, and therefore people are beginning to um, be not as authentic as they okay. might be. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, this, um, <clears throat> I don't have di as direct an experience as Nick does, but uh, I want to share a very short uh, snippet of conversation that I had with uh, a friend and local operator in Malawi uh, who works with local communities, community development, a lot of economic development like Nick talked about, um, where one of the challenges that she has routinely faced is the sense of artificiality that tourists have when visiting a location, of tempering their expectations so that what they get uh, is in line with what they want to get versus um, what the community wants to give based on their expectations of what tourists want to receive. And it's a complex formula and I might not have stated it as, as clearly as, as I could. The, the concrete example is when people come to any of the villages with which she works, there is very often a dance, a welcome dance, and it is not a staged cultural dance like you would find in, in some places, but uh, uh, an impromptu upswell of joy and appreciation, usually involving lots of kids and pulling a lot of the travelers into a dance circle. And to many of the travelers, it is terribly, terribly embarrassing because they feel like it is staged, um, artificial, 
uh, and unnecessary and, and, and perhaps even improper. And what is very hard to explain to some travelers is an experience like that is something provided to any person who arrives in a village. That could be people from another village in the same country, in the same district, in the same, in the same area. And just because a traveler wants something to be what we perceive as travelers to be authentic doesn't mean they're going to get what they want to receive. Uh, so a lot of, the, a lot of what, uh, what Sonia brought up in her question and what people discuss, and I have been party to some of the discussions on, on by tour operators and when media are present, is how to temper both sets of expectations on the community side and on the traveler side so that what people experience on both sides is as quote unquote authentic as is possible based on those expectations. Travelers need to go in and know that something is going to happen and know that it is genuine and by the same token a community needs to be ready to share things that uh, that, that they have been that they have been helped to understand travelers might want and expect in certain ways. Thank you Ethan. Anyone else have a view on photography and I think just to add to what Ethan just said about uh, you know the the traveler getting educated to know what to ex expect you know when they go into these communities is a very important factor partly because I think media plays a very important role there you know to educate these people other tribes are not going to read what media is written uh, it's basically travelers going to these places and I think you're right I think the question with Sanjay is is actually really important. Um, I personally haven't had any experience on that aspect, but uh, it'd be interesting to know more from 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 others. Yeah. You know, I have two experiences that that I'll mention briefly. The one was attending a tourism uh, industry conference in Quito, Ecuador, and there were a number of events that were really created uh, for the the tourism agents and the industry, and of course, everyone was wearing costumes and everyone was wearing, you know, doing these traditional whatever events, but they weren't traditional and you knew that they were costumes. It wasn't what these people would be wearing every day. And everything was very manufactured. And for me that made me very uncomfortable. Uh, that said, you know, when, it when you take it down a notch or two, uh, you can go to a, a simulated show and again, there will be an audience for this, or people who want this and need this, and uh, and people who benefit locally. And Carlos, you know, in Oaxaca, Mexico, there's this incredible event called the Galagetza that occurs in July every year. And there are there's a main show on uh, on the in the auditorium on the big Cerro Fourteen. And again, this is something in which is lavishly produced. But it is kind of a it is a local production, and it is um, you know it is tourist friendly, but it's also really made and manufactured there in Oaxaca. And at the same time, for the people who don't have the opportunity to visit Oaxaca for this big Galagetza celebration, and I'm not even talking about the smaller Galagetzas in the villages, there are nightly Galagetzas during the tourist season at some of the hotels. And again, I think it really goes to the point of explaining to visitors what the options are. And you know, if you want true authenticity, then you better go to the village. But if this is your only trip to Oaxaca in your lifetime, and you'd like to see the cultural dances, then I can't think of a nicer and more pleasant experience than going to the Hotel Monte Alban. Uh, which pioneered the Galagetza dance now, what, 30, 40 years ago as a way of Again, creating some economic revenue and uh, creating jobs for people who truly love their culture and and love to dance. Carlos, can you talk a little bit? Uh, what are your thoughts on on this? Well, I think uh, I think it's great if you want to know about the local folkloric dances and about the local um, local artistic interpretations of. Uh, indigenous peoples in, around the state of Oaxaca. If you come to join one of these Galaguetas, I think there are three or four hotels now that are offering that, those shows accompanied with the dinner, which is um, a very touristic attraction and uh, incentivates also the knowledge of, of the local people who are um, 
participated in these dances because in the in the in the Gelaguetza, in the main Gelaguetza that happens in July in the villages and in Oaxaca, <laughs> all of these people coming to dance are from the communities, from the villages of the of, 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 of the regions that these where these dances are, are created. But in the hotels are, are are young people from colleges or from high schools that uh, are from Oaxaca. They are also native from Oaxaca, but they are they are not indigenous. No, they are like uh, the common population of the city of Oaxaca, and they learn about all of these dances from all of the states. They get to know the state very well through these dances. So they interpret these dances to, to tourists or to people who are interested in seeing the the, the lagueta in a hotel. And, and and they they pass along this this form of communication while they're learning about the traditions, no? While they're learning about the traditions, the the costumes, the, the expressions more, because when they are interpreting the dances, they have to to um, to show how the the personality of the people from these regions are. I know some of the people from the Sierra are very shy. The indigenous people from the colder weather are very shy, but the people from the Coast region that is warmer, a warmer weather are very, very happy and always like a whistling and, and singing. So it's it's very interesting not only for 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 the for the tourists coming and, and appreciate how are the the different regions of Oaxaca, but also for the local people to understand a, to have a better understanding of the of their own culture, no, their own state. You no, know? I think it's very very interesting. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, um, and Sonia, thank you very much for that question. Uh, just a technical note of remember, folks who are on the screen, uh, if you uh, click the the Q and A app on the left side of the screen, you'll be able to see some of the questions that we have received. And uh, I'll be asking you for your comments as well if you have any interjections. Uh, but I'd like to go to a, a question posted by Alistair McKenzie and from Travel Coffee Break. And Alistair asks, says, uh, my soul sinks a little. Every time indigenous groups decide or are persuaded to generate revenue by building a casino, am I right to be depressed? Um, I'm going to answer that quickly myself and solicit your views. I mean, I live here in Nevada, and I've worked with uh, people. Um, I have met people um, who work with people in casinos. And I'd like to, you know, fir firmly express my ignorance on this topic. Um, it is what distinguishes U.S. indigenous tourism from so many other parts of the world that this is one of the main out, uh, ways that we um, permit uh, indigenous groups in the United States to eke out a living uh, through tourism. Uh, I'm confused by it. Uh, I know there are quite a few instances in which the casinos have been very profitable for the communities. I know there are some instances in which the casinos have been quite uh, successful in interpreting and bringing uh, supporting indigenous culture, but at the end of the day, you know, is you know, I'm dissatisfied that you know, is this really the best we have in the United States? Um, does anyone have experiences or thoughts on casinos and indigenous tourism? And no is a fine answer. Um, but um, I, this is a topic I want to come back to, and I don't, you know, if, and ideally, if I were to hold an indigenous tourism workshop in the United States, I would have no problems having it at a casino, and I would have no problems kind of, you know, soliciting or create, you know, creating some sort of a process in which we we chose a, a casino to have the event. I, I see no difference between some of these casino resorts and, major, you know, the the major hotels where we have where we stage our ecotourism events. So, you know, if it's done well, it can be done well. Uh, yeah. I, I would just maybe add in there, Ron, I think, get back to that original point I mentioned, which is um, what is, the really question is what is indigenous and the what spans, I believe, someone with an indigenous ancestry or living in an indigenous lifestyle um, can vary. And I think in North America we we have very few people living indigenous lifestyles um, minus some Inuits and potentially some folks in, 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 in the western central states. Um, but again, it's, it's, 
it's supporting it's supporting someone with an indigenous ancestry in a responsible way. I don't know if casinos quite are, are the way to do that. I don't really have an opinion on that, but I do know how how we approach sort of preservation of indigenous cultures in North America is very different from, from how we preserve and help develop indigenous cultures um, in indigenous parts of the world, like South America and Africa and things like that. Thank you. Uh, I, here, go, go ahead. Please, Mike. Um, I'm not, just to begin with, I'm not a big fan of, of casinos or uh, Aboriginal casinos, but there is a... a an example near Toronto here, a couple of hours north, uh, where a First Nation developed a casino on their reserve lands. And there is a fairly strong cultural element to the casino in the design, of course. Most of them are like that. But they have also added a, an interpretive uh, rotunda in the middle of the casino that all the, uh, the visitors um, have an opportunity to experience. And it, it's a... a, a, a uh, audio an animatronics and it's sort of using modern technology but to tell some of the history of this First Nation which is small but it's something anyways but the big thing I think in this the casino that I'm familiar with is that the the profits are distributed amongst First Nations throughout Ontario so that a lot of different First Nations benefit from the dollars that are made in that casino and they use it for social or recreation community needs and and that's quite a positive thing but uh, at the end of it I'm, I'm still not a huge fan of, of, of casino tourism but it's filling a, a market need right that's right I hear you um, I want to go forward to uh, the question that Ayako has, has posed uh, and, and thank you good to hear from you Ayako um, are there examples of media coverage of indigenous tourism done well? Maybe some examples of actual pieces or publications that can be considered best practices or recommendations on how to do it well. Um, all right, folks, have we read anything that we're really pleased with in terms of indigenous tourism coverage? I have a, an idea about a, a well-managed indigenous tourism. Ron? I hear you, Carlos. Hear Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think in, in, in New Zealand, uh, with the Maori dances, they also do very very well manage of the tourism, indigenous tourism um, promotion, no? I think when you, when you visit uh, New Zealand, you have the chance to know about the Maori culture through their dances and through the, through the different, also very similar to the Galagetza, no? There are performances in, in different places in in New Zealand, to where you can witness the Maori dances, no? Well, you know, um, Carlos, um, Carlos, you know, specifically, you know, if we, you know, specifically to Ayako's question, you know, what about media coverage? And where I think there's a connection between what you said and, and what Ayako is asking, and that would be Maori television. And if anyone's familiar with the channel, uh, Maori television is a New Zealand uh, TV network and website, and they never state that their programs are about tourism, um, but invariably they provide some of, of what I would consider the best coverage of Maori culture and tourism options. I know I'm I, my apologies. I'm going to forget uh, the name, but there is a dancing con there is a dance contest in New Zealand every two years, uh, biennial event, <clears throat> and Maori Television does a great job of covering it. And it's kind of like the Gelagetsa, but New Zealand focused. Um, they do some other great programs. Um, they do some other great programs in which they just visit communities. Um, and again, uh, I would encourage people to take a look at it. That said, if we look at other media stories about New Zealand and the Maori, uh, you know, for the most part, I think you know we rarely hear stories about the tourism. You know, to, again and. and if there are examples, you know, it's going to come from New Zealand media. Uh, Radio New Zealand has a great program we talked about yesterday, the Ahika, and uh, they do the occasional pro, uh, profiles of Maori tourism businesses. But what else is out there that uh, is produced, uh, that it's written by a, a, a journalist or a blogger, an author, 
that really talks about some about indigenous tourism and how to do it right. Anyone? There's um, I, it's just taken me a little while to pull it up, and forgive me, Ron, I haven't been able to get the showcase function to work so that I can actually leave a URL. I can see the ones that are incoming, but I can't quite figure out how to leave one. Um, but there is a website. It's a nonprofit organization's website um, called Traditional Cultures Project at traditionalcultures.squarespace.com. Now, it isn't necessarily tourism specific. Um, but it is uh, a website that focuses on nomadic cultures, indigenous nomadic cultures, and, and disappearing lifestyles and disappearing practices around the world. Uh, I know one of the writers behind it, a guy named Michael Bennon, and a very well-established travel writer with, with lots of credits to his name. And the photography, the writing, the map making that goes along with some of the some of the projects that have been pushed online is, as far as I'm concerned, really quite astounding. Traditionalcultures.squarespace.com. Uh, it goes into, uh, there's a level of depth of appreciation of cultures, in part because the writers actually travel with these nomadic cultures and indulge in, oh, indulge is the wrong word, but, you know, take part in their lives for weeks at a time. Um, the, the, the information that is shared and the, and the, and the obvious reverence for the cultures in which these people live, these, these dying cultures, uh, these sadly dying cultures, is really quite magical and, and to a level that I haven't seen in many, many other places. Um, in, in case that anyone is being a little bit shy here, I want to uh, shout out to, to Greg and his work at Transitions Abroad. There's some very, very good uh, coverage of indigenous tourism uh, and for my own purposes the some of the articles that I've that I've published on the travel word uh, which is a website I manage uh, focusing on responsible sustainable and local travel has been written by people who have really focused to the degree that they feel they can as outsiders on lifestyles and lifestyle choices in indigenous communities and the decisions the tough decisions sometimes they've made to open their cultures to outsiders um, uh, I, there's there's some good stuff in there. You just have to search around and find it. I'd be particularly interested, Nick and Mike, to learn, uh, given your work with communities, whether or not you've had visiting journalists uh, who or have pitched articles to journalists who've been able to to give fair representation to the projects that you've been part of. Yeah, I'll make a comment there. Yeah, and answer to your question, Ethan. Yes, we. Uh, over the uh, last couple of years, anyways, up in Arviat, we had some budget that we used for uh, media fam tours and uh, invited some few people, photographers, videographers, and and uh, and other media uh, people to uh, to experience the Arviat program, and and they did get some very good positive coverage out of the out of those efforts. It takes uh, you know it takes. Uh, Resources to get media people up to experience these these uh, remote community tourism products, but uh, but the results are 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 uh, obvious. But I think the the big point is that there's just not enough of it. There are some good people out there trying to draw attention to Aboriginal uh, cultural tourism programs or ecotourism programs, and they're doing a good job. But it's just too little, and there's a need for a lot more. And there's a lot of mis uh, misuse, I think, of, of uh, Aboriginal culture too. And in, in, uh, if you know, historically, Australia has uh, not to point fingers, but they've uh, they've used the uh, the Aboriginal Aborigine culture down there in, in a lot of their uh, tourism marketing programs, and 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 it's not backed up. It's beginning to to to, to be backed up by the uh, Support for the actual Aboriginal tourism products on the ground, but uh, initially it was using the images and using the the culture and the and the myths and so on for marketing advantage without really substantiating that with uh, by supporting Aboriginal tourism in the back. Thank you, Mike. Nick, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, we've had um, we've uh, we've been involved in one, as I mentioned, uh, Chalky Chaka Valley. That's really our first big push in actually creating a project in a particular indigenous community. Um, we have a lot of partners and 
and past employees who grew up in indigenous lifestyles. And I think that's kind of where I was coming from on the perspective that indigenousness needs to be looked at holistically, but specifically in regards to creating a project. We have had um, a friend of mine. So I'm in Peru. I, I live in Peru more or less full time. I spend a lot of time in the Andes. Um, and there's a lot of folks, at least in Cusco, Peru, uh, resources in regards to some media resources and photography. And a friend of mine, Andrew Dare, uh, has done some incredible documentation of uh, the Chaka Chaka community. Um, but it, the creation of this for us, this was just our experience, creation of that particular project, it was very personal. Um, it was a community that I've known um, for about a decade. And so the decision the decision to bring outsiders to this community was was not an easy decision. It was definitely took some time and discussion and, and sort of moral, you know, moral sort of reflection um, inside. So so I think we're very protective on how on how we we present this particular project. We're very protective on who we bring to the particular valley. Um, for us, it's not something that drives our profits as a company. For us, it's it's very much a, a collaboration between us and the community, um, and it's also something that I generally just get a great joy out of. So, we're very protective on who we bring and and how the particular project is is sort of presented. But I think probably just because it was a uh, it was it was very personal in the creation of it as well. So I think that. That's, but again, this is our first run, we, we're, and we're very interested in, in kind of understanding and hearing from you folks on understanding, you know, the evolution of these projects, because um, we see, as I mentioned earlier, we see a lot of these projects that have become sort of more mainstream or sort of commoditized, turned into some sort of commodity, and so we're trying to um, really tread carefully on, on making sure that this evolves in, in the way we, we and our and our partners on the ground in Chalky Chalk envision it. <laughs> good, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Ayaka, for a very good question. And I'm going to ask this question that I'm, I'm assuming there will be no answer to, but um, following up with uh, Alistair's question, are there, any, are there any specialist PR groups representing indigenous tourism? I, I could just say, I, I'm, uh, Michael McCall, I don't know if he's actually here viewing this show, but I know Michael, um, he's based out of San Francisco. I couldn't say, I can't say these he's in any way a specialist, um, but I do know Michael McCall was, was instrumental in sort of helping us foment certain ideas on what can be done and some of the advantages that we had being on the ground in Peru um, and sort of helping us foment some of the ideas to get our, our projects going. And I know he does some great PR work as well and, and press release distribution. So McCall Communications uh, might be might be a suggestion. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matthew asks, are there any uh, are there any good examples? Uh, well, we've discussed this a bit, but are there any good examples of indigenous tourism done well? And um, <clears throat> Avishek, we haven't heard from you in a while. Um, can you think of any operations that do indigenous tourism well? Um, well, it's I won't say it's um, it's uh, the example that I, it comes to mind is uh, the Hornbill Festival that happens in Nagaland in the northeast of India. Um, it's basically getting uh, different tribes together uh, and a promotion of the festival itself over Nagaland, and it has won awards in in those ways from. Uh, the government. My myself, I haven't actually operated there, but I know that I would be operating. It happened once, once a year, and uh, it's the Hornbill Festival that happens in Nagaland. So yeah, that is a. Uh, it's more of a, a promotion of uh, the uh, the local tribe in the area, and uh, there are a lot of tribes that live in in Nagaland. Um, yeah, so that's that's what comes in mind. But uh, uh, I don't know if it is uh, correlated to the question, though. Um, well, um, by the way, uh, on a side note, uh, Friday we've just confirmed with the people from uh, the alternative in India that we're hosting an untravel tweet chat about indigenous tourism. So we'll hear more from India on Friday, Friday 8 p.m. India Standard yeah. Time, 7.30 here in Las Vegas. I also want to give a shout out to Carlos and um, his program with Envia, I think, 
you know, while not explicitly indigenous, certainly works with more than half of the people he works with are, are Zapotec and other indigenous groups in Oaxaca. Um, <clears throat> I certainly am placing that on one of my on my top ten list of of endeavors. Um, Carlos, can you talk a little bit more about Envia or any other projects that you're seeing that work? Well, uh, I think Envia has has done a, we've done a great work, especially thanks to the volunteers that are now uh, running tours, teaching the English classes to children of artisans in two villages. And also, the participation of the women has changed a lot within the last five years. The, the, the women of, uh, that are participating are more open to share about their lives, their cultures. So I think, uh, I think it's been quite um, successful because of that open participation of every, everybody. I also, thinking about indigenous projects, I think... Uh, the, the Pueblos Mancomunados project, that, that it is a project that connects a hiking trails between communities in the, in the Sierra of Oaxaca. Uh, it was a project created a, a long time ago and it started with nine, nine different indigenous towns in, in the Sierra. And now many, many, there are many other towns that are not part of Pueblos Mancomunados, like uh, Calpulalpan that has a hospital of traditional medicine in which they, they show you, they give you massages, they give you an introduction to the traditional medicine in, in that hospital, and they have the hiking trials as well, they have the mushrooms festival in another town in Guajimalayas. Guajimalayas. That's right. So I think in, in, in the collective way was a good idea, the Pueblos Mancomunados, the nine towns connected with hiking trails and cabins so you can sleep every in every town. But also the other towns that have, have uh, had this initiative, for example, I just learned that San Miguel del Valle, that it's a town close to the Oditlan del Valle that produces uh, uh, natural dyed tapestries also, or... Bye, Carlos. Um, Bye. Carlos has just suddenly dropped out, but we'll get back to him, and uh, a big thumbs up to our friends in the Sierra. Juarez in, in Mexico, in Oaxaca, that, it, that they have done exceptional work, and that's worthy of a conversation itself. Ethan? Ron? Yeah, uh, I'm not, for, for in the interest of not playing favorites, I'm not going to name any specific tour operators on, other than those who are here on the, uh, on, on the panel with us who are doing great work. Um, but Hi. The, question, the question is a, is a leading question, and, and, and the answer I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to step it, so I'm going to sidestep it by encouraging people to do research, more research. In pretty much every country in the world so far that I have taken the time to look into in terms of uh, indigenous tourism product, or more specifically community-based product, community-based tourism being a slightly bigger cast of net, uh, that includes anyone native to a particular place, and I know the choice of the word natives is going to be a potentially dangerous one, um, but, but I think it's important. Community-based tourism there is fantastic community-based tourism all over the world, and you really don't have to look very hard to find some great stuff. Um, whether you're going through the World Travel and Tourism Council's Tourism for Tomorrow Awards or the old Colibri Awards that Ron helped curate and, and other indigenous product uh, through ties to the International Ecotourism Society and members that are the, taking part in that, through member organizations of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. There are so many organizations these days focusing on meaningful, responsible, sustainable, interesting, and locally focused, community-based indigenous product. It's so easy to find, and people who say they're having trouble finding it aren't really just taking the time to do so. The challenge is whether or not it's meaningful to the local communities in a way uh, that balances the tables a little bit, and there, there it's a little bit harder, but that, just to bring things back a little bit to the topic of this particular hangout, is the role of media to go a little bit deeper and to find product and talk about it in a way that helps travelers understand what is a little bit more well-balanced in a way that makes it rewarding both to the traveler who visits and important to the host community that has worked so hard to responsibly uh, showcase the, their, their cultures and their lifestyles. 
Well said, Ethan. Well said. Um, good sidestep. Um, any other specific examples? Yeah, if I could throw in a few Canadian examples, I'd like to. Um, I'll start out on the on the west coast in British Columbia. The the Aboriginal tourism sector is very well organized in British Columbia under a an organization titled the Aboriginal Tourism Eight a, a, Aboriginal Tourism BC. Um, and I would encourage you to go to their website, Google it, go to their website, and they have a, a an inventory of of Aboriginal owned and operated products throughout that province. One in particular that I'm familiar with um, that is a really great example is Spirit Bear Lodge in a tiny community called Clem 2 in the Great Bear Rainforest and uh, it's true community-based tourism. They have a small 12-room lodge that they built and own and operate themselves and and they also run tours out to uh, uh, among the islands to see some of the cultural heritage sites, the ancient uh, big houses, and uh, to see the to view the spirit bear in the right season, or grizzly bears and other wildlife. Um, that's a great example. Another great example is the uh, Torngat Mountain Base Camp in in Labrador on the east coast. Uh, the Inuit from Nunatsiavut, the uh, the Inuit part of Labrador own and operate that base camp facility which is just outside of a, a national park, Tongat Mountain Base uh, National Park and it's uh, a base camp that, that caters to tourists as well as scientists who are doing research in the park. They bring youth there, Inuit youth there for cultural exchange programs um, and it's a, a, a really neat model and then of course the third one would be uh, RVAT Community Ecotourism, the, the group that I've been working with for the last five years up in Nunavut, a uh, community of, of just under 3,000 people and they develop their own tourism program. A lot of it's cultural and uh, part of it's uh, wildlife viewing for polar bears and, and, and the huge caribou migration that happens there every year. So those are three really good examples. There's a lot of others, and I know, having lived in, and worked in, in New Zealand, uh, in New Zealand and Australia, there are lots of great uh, Aboriginal tourism initiatives down there. And, and the Maori in New Zealand have been a big part of New Zealand's tourism industry for a long time. So they're well ahead of the game. You know, what I find interesting, speak, hopefully we'll be able to schedule a, a hangout with uh, Nell and Kaylee of the ITBW award-winning Time Unlimited Tours uh, based in Auckland, that they were discussing with me earlier this week that there are only 32 export-ready uh, Maori-owned businesses in New Zealand. Hmm. And personally speaking, you know, it's been really difficult to try to touch base with either the Aboriginal tourism groups, uh, associations in Australia, or the Maori tourism groups in New Zealand, you know, at an official level, I think there's a, there's a lot to be desired. Um, there is quite a bit, there's, there's offering, but really finding out what it is and where it is uh, as a journalist is really a challenge. Um, that said, you know, I would encourage you uh, to do the following. Uh, as uh, participants in this web chat or viewers in this web chat. If you know good examples, you know, feel free to uh, write down the names and include the web link and post that directly on the YouTube video or on the Google event page. And if you'd like, you know, you're also welcome to tweet about it. We'd love to see the uh, tweets that celebrate indigenous tourism done well uh, on Twitter using that hashtag, uh, hashtag IPW4. But you know, there are, you know, as a, you know, thank you, Ayako, for the question. You know, there are some good, great examples around the world. And uh, thank you, Ethan, for really deftly sidestepping that question and reminding us that we need to do some research and uh, keep on the eye for, for examples. Perfect. Um, wanted to follow that up. We are getting some good questions. If, you, if you're watching online, you can see the questions that we have. Um, but <clears throat> selecting, and again, these are great. These are all great questions. 
but uh, Matthew has asked, are there any notable DMOs that take a particularly inclusive approach to promoting indigenous tourism? And I have to say it would be Canada that seems to be leading, but what are your thoughts? Well, Canada's got great lead, Peru certainly, and, and it can speak more specifically to that, certainly in their promotional materials. Uh, New Zealand has been brought up, Australia has been brought up. I Just for transparency purposes, I used to help handle social media for Tourism NT, the Northern Territory of, of Australia, where there is a great deal of emphasis placed on, on the, the Aboriginal communities of Australia. Uh, and Mike was right to bring up the fact, I think it was Mike who mentioned that in early days it was more purely for commercial and promotional purposes, but in recent years uh, a great deal of necessary attention has been given to proper representation and decision making uh, within the Aboriginal communities of the Northern Territory and Western Australia and Queensland, in fact the entire country, to make sure that the product that's put out there is appropriate, respectful, that the images used have been signed off on by the communities so that the people presented are living uh, and, and, and shown in places where the locals from the communities, the elders from that community have approved uh, sh the sharing. In other words, some images are not supposed to be shared. Some, some uh, cultural practices are, are still kept within closed quarters, within the closed community that, that uses them and are not for not for tourism purposes. Um, uh, you know, it's one of those things where the stronger the presence of, a, of an indigenous community, the stronger the representation. And I think governments, not necessarily at the national level, um, are beginning to understand that community-based tourism, just because it isn't, uh, it isn't big spend tourism, it isn't $250 a night, uh, four-star hotel tourism, uh, it doesn't mean that tourism boards shouldn't pay attention, and many of them are getting the right kind of messages in the right kinds of ways. Very good, thank you. Anyone else with a view on the DMOs? I, I would just mention again, I think probably just from my perspective, uh, being, being based out of Peru and being such an indigenous country, most of our the draw to Peru is really about its culture. Obviously, we have the archaeology. We have Machu Picchu, as everyone knows, and, and some other critical sites. But just as much of the, of the history and the archaeology, it really is the culture. Um, and so the highlight is the indigenous Andean cultures there. And there's countless, countless projects uh, in Peru, either at Lake, both at Lake Titicaca, um, you'll hear, you'll see the project with mountain lodges of Peru. Ethan, you mentioned sometimes it's not that, you know, $250, $500 a day experience, but um, in Peru, because of the pure logistics that it takes to get to some of these most remote, remote places on the planet, um, there is a pretty big price tag, and a lot of the major tour operators <clears throat> um, of the world are using, are working in indigenous tourism. Um, Mount Lodges of Peru, as I mentioned, is one specific example that actually has lodges that were built in conjunction with the community um, that are deep in the Andean range uh, that are very much a luxury $500 a day experience um, and it's something that's done in conjunction with the community um, and the community is also in part help, helping run these, these luxury lodges. So I think, I think it can run, it doesn't have to be just the, the overnight on the dirt floor um, you know, community-based tourism experience. I, I do think there's a lot of examples of, of very high-end, um, logistically complicated uh, indigenous tourism out there as well. Nick, specifically, on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you think uh, Peru, tu Peru tourism promotes indigenous tourism? Promotes it? Um, you know, I, I, can, I can really only speak from a perspective of South America and Central America. Um, I, my particular opinion, of course, I might be biased. I actually am a Peruvian citizen as well. <laughs> uh, so, so I'll do that as just disclosure to begin with. But in, in general, in regards to South America, um, Peru, Peru, I think, works harder and does a better job than any of the other countries. I mean, especially when you look at countries like Argentina, like Chile, uh, Uruguay, and Brazil. Um, Parts of Brazil are doing it okay in the Amazon Amazon region, but the, these are destinations that are very focused on the nature, whether it be Patagonia and Chile and Argentina, or the urban highlights of Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro. 
Um, when you talk about the Andean countries like Peru and Ecuador, uh, Colombia and Venezuela, even though not many people are traveling there now, um, Peru, Peru, I think by far promotes indigenous tourism better. One is and and one is the, the infrastructure in Peru. Um, in the entire southern part of Peru, there's there's a numerous quality infrastructure that is um, creating development in a lot of indigenous communities and a lot of indigenous regions uh, of Peru. There's more than a million people that speak. And depending on who's counting, um, much more than that, who speak pre-Columbian indigenous languages. So um, it's very much not how I grew up. It was very much uh, in the history books, and in Peru, it's very much living. And, and I think Peru has been able to capitalize on that from an investment perspective internationally because we've seen tourism increase significantly over the last 10 years because because the cultures there still are so um, are, are still very uh, authentic, are still very beautiful, are still very present. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anyone else with a view on this? Sorry, let me chime in really quickly just because of the mention of the of the of the high end ecotourism. I didn't mean to suggest that it wasn't present and and valuable and in fact very important. Um, it's just that there it was with with specific regard to tourism boards and how they need to be able to to broaden their horizons a little bit and recognize the different opportunities. And at the mention of high end ecotourism, it is important to mention the fantastic efforts that are that are that are taking place in well, in East Africa and Southern Africa very specifically, I can speak more purposefully to Eastern Africa where, for example, the land conservancy efforts in Kenya involve the local tribal communities working with private interests to create these unbelievably beautiful ecotourism lodges out in remote parts of, of the country uh, that are recognizing tribal practices, that are feeding opportunity in terms of training and welfare back to those uh, back to those communities, uh, along with the mon money that comes from opening up these these businesses, but also have the the knock-on effect of conserving land, protecting animals, protecting culture, and providing immeasurably beautiful opportunities to travelers. So yes, there's a lot of stuff out there, high and low, including middle. It's one of the big arguments that I always put forward for people who say I can't find something in my price range. There is eco tourism indigenous tourism, responsible and sustainable travel, community-based tourism at every possible price point reaching the interests of every possible person. If you can't find it, you just haven't looked hard enough. Well, well, well said. You know, uh, well, thank you for answering that question. You know, some background, how I got involved with this and some interest um, goes back, you know, many, many years. Uh, but more recently, uh, back in 2007, 2008, we started creating a, an award for indigenous tourism operations. And that was called the Indigenous Tourism and Biodiversity Website Award, which was coordinated with the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD in Montreal. And one of the things I'm, post I'm putting forward this week is whether, you know, how to renew that. We stopped the award for a simple lack of finance. We couldn't get the funding to continue it. But we held it... Uh, we held it uh, two in editions of the award, and the information is all on the Planeta Wiki. Uh, I've made you know very good friends and contact very good friends with the nominees in this award, but you know we don't really see anything. Uh, in my view, we don't really see kind of a global um, award system or a competition system that kind of shows the diversity, the breadth and depth of indigenous tourism. Uh, I'm hoping that we can discuss, you know, in the back channel and throughout our um, social web channels, how we might reinvigorate that ITBW award. But if we do that, I would like to link it to an, a second award, and that would be to the governments themselves. Uh, I'm frankly dissatisfied uh, with Peru, with Ecuador, with Australia, with New Zealand. With I'm not seeing the uh, the level of promotion and marketing that I think has to come from the authorities themselves. If there is some sort of uh, indigenous tourism, I'm still seeing it as, kind of, you know, quote unquote, travel porn. You know, we see the exotically costumed Indian, but we don't really see anything about that person. And there are some exceptions, but for the most part, you know, it really lacks the specifics. And if I, if I know of one way of getting on people's bad sides, it, it's by exposing their faults. So therein lies the beauty of an award. You know, if we can say, all right, well, let's see some good practices. And if 
Nicholas is saying, you know, the Peru is really doing a good job of promoting indigenous tourism, and we can document that and show that, and Peru wins this award. You know what? I think that steps up the efforts for Ecuador and Colombia that they do a little bit better of a jo better job. But the question that I've had as a writer, as a publisher, as a host of Planeta, you know, is again, there's a whole world out there, but you know, a lot of travelers don't speak Quechua or don't speak Spanish. So, do we have any information and promotional information in English? And there are so many wonderful efforts. I'm more familiar with Ecuador. There are so many wonderful efforts, but it's the level of promotion that's missing. And zero, but zero information in English. And if we were to find ways of encouraging the tour operators themselves to do that, as well as the governments, I think we could make a, a big leap forward. But, you know, that's an idea I think I'd like to pursue uh, beyond this chat. Um, but I would certainly, again, welcome you to post some good links and good resources here on the event page or the YouTube video. And if we can, let's get that award started again. Any comments? I'm on for that award. I will support you on that. Definitely, India is. I, I speak from the Indian subcontinent side of things. I think you're quite right. It's really a sad scenario going to WTM and watching people dance with Kathakali, you know, Kuchipuri, all the different dances, but you actually don't know the person. You know, and you know the culture, they, they're more on culture tourism, is more the promotion than actually indigenous. India would have about 650 indigenous tribes, you know, who do you promote? You don't need that many, this thing. You, it's, it's like a, a lost cause, you know, it's in terms of, it's really sad as an operator to see what should we focus on. And yes, you're right. I mean, it very rightly said, you know, that research needs to be done for any and everything that I do as an operator. I have to look into the ins and outs and negativity. Maybe do a SWOT analysis in the place, see what I'm, my footprints are in that in that area, basically, and how my 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 agents can, uh, my suppliers can can benefit that place for a sustainable use for the future. Well said, Ron. I'm sorry to interrupt. I've got a I've got a. Forgive me, I've got a call in five minutes that I have to do a little bit of prep for, but thank you for hosting this conversation. Thanks to everybody for being there. Um, I don't want to cut you off, but I do have to run. I'm, I'm no, 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 that's, uh, that's much appreciated. And Ethan, thank you so much for, for the work on behalf of Outbounding. Uh, we're having a terrific dialogue and Q&A there. And uh, again, thank you for some really stellar points today. You know I want to make a, you know a super cut of just Ethan comments. <laughs> <laughs> My, my my strongly worded uh, overly overly thought out strong well, well done as always hey thank you very much all right thanks everybody I'll catch up with you all later bye bye well very very good um, <clears throat> surprise surprise but we I don't know if you can see it on our uh, control panel but we do have ten viewers right now in real time so yay thank you viewers um, all right so. Here's where we stand. We're, we're not so satisfied with the media coverage. We're all exceptionally pleased at the opportunities uh, that indigenous tourism provides both indigenous communities and visitors. Um, where do we go from here? Um, final question. Uh, if you were to envision you know, the, the kind of media coverage that you'd really be proud of, and it might take us to 2020 or 2024 to see, but you know, what's on your wish list? What should we be seeing as, as readers, as viewers of information about indigenous tourism? And we can wrap it up here. Nick? Um, I, I really see a need for uh, immersion of, of whoever's doing the writing, the, the media. Um, they need to they need to understand the places at a, at a much more deeper level. Obviously, I understand there's some logistical issues with if they're based out of New York or London or where they may be. Um, they might only have a week to go um, to the remote parts of New Zealand or you know the Andes Mountains. But to really understand it, it's very it's very complex. And I think just as we're all um, Human, we we have a sense to see a situation from our from our eyes, from our sort of historical um, perspective, and in, under truly understanding the indigenous communities and indigenous people requires an immersion in, into that. So the more immersion that these that people that are writing about indigenous tourism can do, I, I think the better. 
Beautiful. Mike? Well, I'll make two points, I guess. There's there's really two types of, of uh, media exposure that indigenous tourism requires. One, of course, is the it to the the, uh, the the travelers and the general population, tourists and so on. That uh, uh, of the uh, first of all, the existence of, of good quality Aboriginal tourism experiences, and and and, uh, and more importantly, that the uh, the uh, the value that those and the importance of, of those tourism businesses to those communities and the people to help preserve the culture to help to help those indigenous peoples continue as the stewards of, of their traditional lands and so on and so forth. So that's one thing and that's the other is to share um, success models and approaches that are taken in different parts of the world by indigenous peoples in developing tourism because that's a big issue is is building capacity, developing capacity. We're starting out in a lot of places, like I was up in Arviat at Ground Zero, they had no no knowledge of, of of what it takes to run a tourism business and to and to uh, to fulfill a tourist needs and expectations. So, um, by sharing amongst indigenous peoples, we 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 can help build more success and and uh, um, in indigenous tourism. So those are a couple of. Uh, I think important points about media exposure. Great point. And Greg? Uh, sorry, you caught me off guard. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm going to have to pass on this. I apologize. No, that's fine. And Avishek? Um, I think the, the final bit uh, is uh, media. You quite rightly said um, that um, we need, like Mike just mentioned, about exposure. I think that's really important factor from a media point of view like you know we as a as me as a travel agent would like to know what is happening in the area on me I need to research in the area as well to try and tell they, they should, there has to be a sustainable factor from everyone from every angle um, be it the indigenous community itself impacts analyzed to see the you know reality good quality content coming out uh, good content coming out from there um, and uh, you know it has to be um, it has to be open basically Beautiful. that this is what uh, is happening uh, in ground reality basically and uh, no like so called you know it happens in a dream world approach which currently may be happening in some destinations well i tell you i think you know we we have uh, done our job of of getting the conversation started i want to thank you all for your time and interest in this uh, we're going to be stopping the broadcast in in a minute um, i think we can do what we're doing right now is the best we can do, which is talking about this and discussing the 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 condition of indigenous tourism, warts and all. And as we project into the future, what could we do and do better? You know, I'm seeing that you know this technology is is something that we're um, we're facing and we're using that really is exceptional. I mean, when I moved to Oaxaca 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I was a professional journalist, and I had my camera, and I had my recorder, and I had this and that, and I could convey to the world through Planeta or through Transitions Abroad, you know, stories of Oaxaca. By the time I left, the ladies who sold the salsa or the hard-boiled eggs in the market had a better cell phone than I have, and their kids were all on Facebook. And the idea of how we tell these stories... Is, has undergone this incredible change. So, you know, I don't exactly know how it will look. I do know that it will require a lot more collaboration and a much more holistic framework. And I think as journalists, we're going to figure out how to curate and how to interact with people. Um, and, you know, no more postcards of anonymous market lady. You know, it's, it's interacting with the people and showing people in advance how they can really enjoy that immersion experience Nicholas was talking about. So here we are. We're going to go forward with Indigenous Peoples Week. I want to thank you for your time. Um, keep an eye on uh, uh, you know, all of the social web channels. We have a little outpost there on Google+, on Facebook, and uh, Twitter using that IPW4 hashtag. This video is live streamed and archived on YouTube. So please, you know, participants in this chat, you know, please um, overwhelm us with some of the links you've been talking about and other examples. 
and you know get into that Twitter dialogue and and hash it out. Um, thank you so much for your time, and uh, we'll be uh, scheduling more hangouts in the future. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice, nice to speak with you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Ron. Thank, thank you much. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.